Today I want to talk about how to train to win. Training to win. God destined us to be winners. And you know, one of, one of the things that we, we try to boil down is our vision statement is this. We help people win. We help people win. And some people are like, they scratch their head and like, well, what does that mean? Well, let's do the opposite, okay? The world helps people lose. How many people want to lose? Right? We want to help people win. But what does that look like? You know, let's say, let's say you're a married couple and you show up to church and on a scale of one to ten, you know, ten, your, your marriage is like, oh, right? Amen? It's the, the Holy Ghost night of weddings, right? And then uh, zero would be, dear God, we're headed to Judge Wapner, divorce court, Judge Judy, okay? Depends on what, what age you were raised in, Okay. And so let's say you show up to church and your wedding is like, or your, your marriage is like uh, on a scale of one to 10, maybe a four. Okay? Mm. Well, this is what we tell you. If you come to this church and plant yourself in this church, not attend, but plant yourself. You go through growth track, you get plugged into a team, you're tithing, you're serving, you're getting to be known, not just knowing people, but people get to know you. Look, I guarantee you in six months, if you will apply yourself to the word of God and the house of God in six months, we can move that from a four to a seven. Don't you think that's a win? Don't you think that's helping people win? When, when we have families that their kids aren't strung out on drugs and, and messed up and trying to figure out what gender they are, but they're here on Wednesday nights raising their hands, worshiping God, serving God, don't you call that a win? Yeah. See, we help families win. Marriages win. People in business, we help you win in life. Why? Because you're the head and not the tail. Some of you, you walked in and you looked like the tail today. Because the world has been wagging you, but God's going to do some reconstructive surgery and take the tail and put it where it belongs and put the head where it belongs. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 9.24 says it this way. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs. Every one of us, we are in this race. Whether we want to compete or not, we're in it. But only one person gets the prize, so run to win. If we're going to live life, we might as well live life to win. Okay, but, but something that is obvious, you will not have all the money and all the time to do everything that you want to do. Just not going to happen. And that's why some of you are so disappointed because you're trying to live out dreams that God never gave you. But you will have all the time and all the money to do everything that God wants you to do. And when you, when you readjust your mind and your framework around that and your priority around that, and let me help you with this. The origin of the word priorities was never priorities. It was priority. If you look at etymology, it was priority. And then we come along and we think, oh, there's priorities. There are many things that are important. No, no. Priority means that there's only one thing that is important. And when you seek God first with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself, right? That's what happens. When you seek the kingdom of God first, priority. There is no such thing as priority. Tees. There's not many things that are important. There's one thing that is important. When you get the one thing right, everything else will come into alignment. And see, 2 Peter 1.3 says, he is, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us everything that we need, everything, all supply that is necessary for us to attain this life that God wants us to live in a godly manner. But notice it says divine power. And some of you, you might be from a church background where divine power is resting under some tombstone and in some graveyard to say that the power of God is not for today. Well, that's passed away. Only the disciples needed that. Only, only you know, the apostles needed the power of God. And, and now that the, the apostles are gone, we don't need that power of God anymore. Well, let me tell you something. What about us? Homie needs some power. Okay? I need some power. I need some divine power. I need God to show up today and move in my life and do some amazing things that man cannot do. I still believe in the supernatural. This church still believes in the supernatural. His super upon our natural makes things happen that we couldn't do on ourselves. 
2 Timothy 2.5 says, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Let me help you with this. There are rules in life. Okay? Now, the, the left agenda doesn't believe in rules. Right? Because they don't want to be held to anything that they said last year. Right? We will not mandate vaccinations. We will not do that. No way. We are mandating vaccinations. You will not live without a vaccination. What happened to last year when we will not do that? Is that an L? Is that it? Okay. That's not, that's not loser. That's liar. See, we don't, we don't get to play those games. We can't say one thing and do another. We are held to the word of God. We are held to biblical integrity and a standard of character. So, so we can't live a double life and get away with it. The world can because they're leading blind people. But what we're doing is leading people into the light. We lead people into the light. But there are rules that we have to abide by. Now, if you're in a game and you don't abide by the rules, you can get ejected from the game. Anyone? 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 You can get ejected. You're out of here. What? Right? Baseball. You're out of here. The umpire, he ejects you out of the game and you kick dirt on him. And it's not fair. Well, guess what? I don't care if you identify as a Christian or not. You have to play by the rules that God has laid out before us. So Proverbs tells it this way, though, in 2410, if you faint in a crisis, you're weak. Another translation says if you faint in a crisis, there wasn't much to you to begin with. Whoa. And, and I kind of see that this is the modern-day church in America. We, we had faith as theory. You know, and we used faith to, oh, oh, believe God for a new car. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but, but it's not really the priority. If we would seek what God wants first, we wouldn't be carnal in our faith. And, and what happened was people that used their faith for carnal achievements suddenly fainted in the midst of COVID crisis. And now they can't write another book on faith. Because faith was merely theory. See, when I was preaching in Nepal years ago, and I was doing pastor's conferences, years ago, I, I, I said, I proclaimed it early on. I said, look, faith is theory in America. It sounds good, but they've never been tested. And now COVID tested the body of Christ. And we really know who's standing and who fainted. It was on the morning of July 4th, 1952, the, the California coast was shrouded in fog. And it was a 21-mile swim between the Catalina Island and the California coast. And Florence Chadwick, she's 34 years old at the time, and she waited in the water to begin her achievement of being the first woman to be able to swim that 21 miles straight. She already accomplished swimming the English Channel both directions. But as she got in the water, the water was numbingly cold that morning, and the fog was so thick that she couldn't even really see the, the chase boats that were surrounding her to try to keep the sharks away from her while she was swimming to her goal. More than 15 hours later, numbed with the cold, she asked her mom, which was in the chase boat with her, if she could be taken out of the water because she couldn't go on any longer. And her mother and her trainer in the boat alongside her urged her and begged her to not give up, not quit. But you know what? A few minutes later, they went ahead and pulled her out of the water. They got her in the boat, and suddenly the fog cleared up, and she was only a half a mile from achieving the beach on the California coastline. And she said this. She said, I'm, I'm not excusing myself, but if I could have seen the shore, I might have made it. If I could have seen the shore, I might have made it. Look, this is where we get sight and vision confused in church. We get sight versus vision. Sight is seen with your natural eyes. Vision is seen with your heart. And some of you, you have a vision for your family, but you've lost sight of that vision. Because look, her vision is what put her in the water to swim that, that, that goal. It was her sight that took her out of the water. Her natural ability to not be able to see the end goal. 
And some of you, your vision is waned for your marriage. Your vision is waned for your health. That doctor's report and the sight, your eyeballs looking at that doctor's report has become more real than the vision that God has given you for your life. With long life will I satisfy you. And this is why you have to be in church because church and the power of God and the, and the word of God will keep your vision alive. You go out there, you'll live by sight. There's some churches that only live by sight. They only speak by sight. They, they speak fear. But I'm telling you, this church will speak vision of the word of God in your life. Look, we all face numbing waters of doubt and fear. We all do. We all face it when, when, when we're hurting. And when we're hurting, we just want the pain to stop. But that's why you have to have people around you to cheer your vision that God has given you, the vision that has been planted in your heart from most high. 1 Corinthians 9.27 says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. We have to discipline ourselves to do the will of God. It is not always easy to do the right thing. It is not always easy to believe the right thing. And this is why I'm going to lead us to three specific things. They're not the only things, but these can be three things that can help guide us into training for a win in our life. Because winning is important. Don't tell me it's not. Some of you football fans are fanatics about, about your football or about your, 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 the European football. It's called soccer in America. Or cricket. Cricket. <laughs> What's cricket? First of all, you should never, you should never train alone. You should never train alone. Why? Because you can never take yourself further than your own ability. You are the lid in your life. And so you need some people around you to push you and to stretch you and to help you. But some people like to be the smartest person in the room. Come on, they like to be the smartest person in the room. And if you're, in the, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You're in the wrong way. I found this out the hard way. I thought I was a helper in special ed. I thought the teacher thought I, I had, like, you know, this outstanding quality to work with other kids my age. And so I'm in this class working with special ed students. And then the teacher caught on and she said, Dennis, you're in the class. <laughs> Okay, that, that was a wake-me-up moment, okay? Yeah, I was in special ed. I rode the short bus. I couldn't tell the difference between purple and blue, and I still can't. Just ask my wife. I, I, I went to walk out the door this morning. She goes, you're going to wear that? That's a summer outfit. I thought that was a compliment. It's summery. Wherever I'm at, the sun is shining. <laughs> See, when you're training, you know, let, let's take the gym. If you're in the gym and you're training, you want to grow in strength, you need a spotter. Because a spotter will help you lift more than you could lift yourself. Now, that seems obvious, but you can only lift what you can lift by yourself. So if you have a spotter, they can come along and they can help you achieve more than you could yourself and stretch you and put a new level in your strength. What does that mean? See, when, when, when you're lifting, a spotter will come along and they might take 5% of the weight off, right? But what that does is help you not to break momentum. That trains the muscle. It's, it's helping the muscle to fully extend and do what it's supposed to do instead of going like this and then you injure yourself. And a trainer will push you and say, you, come on, come on, keep going. I know it's heavy. I know. Come on. But you got this. You got this. I can help you. Because you can do more than you can do on your own safely. And, you know, they can see what you can't. A trainer can spot things that you can't because 
a mirror doesn't show everything. I'm training in the mirror. I'm training in the mirror. Yes, the Word of God is a mirror, but you also need some people alongside you to say, hey, you got the wrong form here. You're not seeing what I'm seeing. Right? You know, if I dance in the mirror, it looks good. But then Josh comes along and says, homie, that ain't working. White boy ain't got the dance. All right? Our, our girls in Nepal say, Papa, no, no, sit down. Because <laughs> they can see what you can't. Like a swing coach. A swing coach can stand back and look and start to articulate some things. No, no, you're not following through. You're breaking your wrists late, your hips. You're not following through. And you're like, oh, oh, okay. And then, and then and no, no, this way, no. Yeah, that's it, that's it. See, I have swing coaches in my life. I have spotters in my life. My pastor is not the nicest guy in the world. But I don't need him to be the nicest guy in the world. I need him to be the best trainer he can be in my life. He's not here to stroke my ego. He's here to decimate it. It's not easy when he says, you need to change that, and that ain't working, and you need to flip this around. And I'm like, holy cow. You're not very nice. He told me, look, if you want to do all the talking, that's called counseling, and you pay me. If you want mentorship, you listen, and I do all the talking. And some of you, you think you want a mentor, but all you want is a counselor when you do all the talking. How can you possibly learn? That's a lot better than, I think it's just kind of marinating with some of you right now. <laughs> God said it's not good for man to be alone, right? Proverbs 18.1 says, whoever isolates himself and seeks their own desire, they break out against all sound judgment. And when you get the right people in your life, they'll say, hey, you're, you're going out of bounds. you got to have some people in your life that can tell you no. Look, husbands, your wives will feel a lot more confident in following you if there's somebody in your life that can tell you no. She's not going to submit to you until you'll submit to somebody else. I'm the head of this whole whole not I do is I'll say it. Yeah, right? Don't forget she's the neck that turns that big head of yours. All well, the ladies are like, mm-hmm. <laughs> We're coming to this church. <laughs> Secondly, you gotta respect every opponent, but fear none. You got to respect every opponent, but don't you fear any opponent. Don't you fear any adversary that stands against you. It was John Wooden that said this. He said, respect without fear may come from being prepared and keeping all things into proper perspective. That's why 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 says, to not be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word. And some of you are alarmed because you got a notice, you, you, got, you got a summons, uh, somebody showed up, you got a doctor's report, maybe you got a bill, and something showed up, and now you're shaken. And the Word of God says, don't you be shaken by this. And look, we practice what we preach around here. We really try to, and if we, if we miss it, we'll acknowledge it and get back to it. But I want you to know, last Sunday, I almost wasn't here. See, we were coming back from Nepal. We were in Dubai. I don't know about you, but PCR tests, um, you can get a lot of them when you travel. We had five in four days. It was great. I have new nostrils today. <laughs> I breathe clearer today than ever before, okay? And so we, we get to Dubai, and you got to understand, Dubai Airport is the busiest airport in the world. A hundred million passengers pre-COVID would go through that airport every year. So they have it down to a science. It's, it's very, those of you that have flown with me through there, it's quick, it's easy. Um, you don't even have to go through a physical immigration. You can go through a digital passport scanner immigration. It's just quick. It's great. And so we get there in plenty of time. We already have our PCR test. And so we're standing in line and it's taken forever. We're like, I have never, I have never seen it this slow before. And we're standing in line and we're just and just inching along. Well, finally, after an hour, now we have an hour yet to board. We haven't gone through immigration. We haven't gone through security. We haven't even gone to the gate. It's a mile away. 
And so the next thing you hear is, Seattle, anybody traveling to Seattle? Anyone? Only Seattle passengers. I'm telling you, you're like, yes. Okay? And so Jack, Jack, you know, as bold as he is, he just broke the line, walked out, and started following him. And, I, and, and I've got three with me. They took three, and they split our group up. I'm like, no, don't go. <laughs> right? So we're like, okay, all right, divide and conquer. So, so Jack's with three, I'm with uh, my three, and, and we finally get to the ticket counter, and uh, passports, and we're standing there. PCR test, hand her the PCR test. She goes, this is no good. Are you vaccinated? No. She looks again, and she says it louder. Are you vaccinated? It felt really that loud, okay? And I'm like, no. She goes, well, you have to go get rapid tests because you can't board the plane. I can't give you your boarding passes without a rapid test. You have to get a new one because it just changed 24 hours. And you have to have a 24 hour. When did this change? Last week. Last week? I didn't get the email. So I'm like, and she's like, well, you probably won't make this flight. We'll have to put you on. I'm like, no, 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 no. I call Chase. Chase was with him. He, thank God we had cell service. I call Chase, and he's like, my other son, and he's like, hey, uh, Dad, they're telling us we're not going to make it. I said, we are going to make it. You are going to go to the PCR. We are all going to get tested. We will go. Because there's no way I was going to make my wife try to figure out how to not explain why the pastor isn't here two weeks in a row. Because I was trying to keep it on the down low while we were out of town for, you know, security reasons and things. So I'm standing there, and she finally says, well, it's down that way. So we're, we're O.J. Simpson, <laughs> right? Bags in hand, right? We are flying. We are flying, okay? Can I say, I can't say O.J.? Hussein Bolt. I, I am. Okay, Hussein Bolt, running through the airport. We'll make it work, okay? We show up to the PCR to thank God nobody's in there. Nobody's in there. I run up. I'm like, how long is it going to take? I need 10 minutes. I'm like, great. I'm throwing credit cards. I'm like, let's pay. Let's go. Let's swab. Let's do this thing. <laughs> I'm serious. We get over to the counter. They swab us. We're still waiting for the other three. And Chase is calling me and saying, well, they're going to put us on another thing. And I said, no, you're not. Get out of here. <laughs> Faith doesn't always have to be polite. Some of you, you have very polite doubt and fear. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You want to be nice, right? And you want to be composed. But I, I, I'm hearing they don't delay flights. They never delay flights. There's no way you're going to make this flight. Well, they come over with an angel. Their ticket counter, lady, she is amazing. Man, we slip her cash. Get me on this flight. <laughs> right? Right? We probably gave her a month's worth of salary uh, in Dubai there. But I'm like, hey, I, you have no idea how much these people eat. If we got to stay another night in you know, another hotel and taxi, I'm saving money. Come on. So, so we're literally, we get the others tested. And I don't know if you know how long 10 minutes is. Right? The little Jeopardy clock. It's like, dong, 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 dong. It's just ringing in your mind. You're like, 10 minutes, ha, ha, two minutes, ha, one minute, ha, right? Literally, literally. And, and the ticket lady agent, she's like, I don't know if we're going to make it. They never hold the planes like this. We, all we can do is run. So we get all the tests. Everybody's negative. I was never so happy to be negative. We get our test, and then she's like, make sure everything is in your bag so you don't have to stop in security. So we're pulling our belts off, laptops, phones, everything's in our bags, untying shoes, and now we got to run, okay? But before we go, she goes, oh, where? I only have three boarding passes. Where's your boarding passes talking to me? And I'm like, I told you she wouldn't give them to us until we had our PCR test. Oh, no! We have 30 minutes to board an international flight before it leaves. I'm like, we are making this flight. <laughs> we literally grab bags. We are flying through the airport. We are running. Jack has no belt on. He's holding his pants. He's got shoestrings going. Right? 
He's in the back. We're chanting, Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. And I'm just like, literally, she runs us. We run through immigration. Literally, we through the passports, and she's just, go, 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 go. We're going through security. We go through, and then Jack gets held up. We're like, Rudy, Rudy. We get on the elevator. We're going up the elevator to go to the boarding gate, and, and it's like, like this. And do you know how long three seconds is for doors to open? You're like, it's like Black Friday. The doors open. We sprint to the ticket counter. They held the plane for us, and we made the flight. It's because we don't want to give, take, we don't want to receive anything that doesn't come from God. God didn't give us a spirit of fear. So why would I take that? Even in the midst, yes, my heart was pounding. Yes, everything in my brain was going, oh no, oh no. My heart's going, oh yes, we are going to make this flight. Natalie, you heard me talk to my son. You will get your butt to this counter now. Well, that's not very spiritual. Yes, it was. We made the flight. Look, any time that you face a problem, and when I, when I was in, is there remedial math? Okay, I was in remedial math, okay? And they always called them problems. You have to solve the problem, okay? Well, I loved times. Anytime multiplication, give it to me. Give it to me. Anytime, you, I don't care how big the number, I know what it is if it's zero times your number. <laughs> I got this. Zero times 1,272,000. Zero. I'm, I'm serious. I was like, give me the, I can solve these problems. But here's the problem. You see this huge number that is standing in front of you, this, this huge problem, this huge diagnosis, all of this, but what you're doing is you're trying to equate it without God in your equation. And anytime you have a problem, you need to put God in your equation. And when you put God in your equation, I can tell you what your outcome is. How do I know this? Because we brought a little girl that has a tumor the size of her face on the outside of her face that grew there within three months. Her name's Depeka. I introduced her photo to you last week. She went in. She had the biopsy done. We won't know the the full picture until the end of this week, probably. She was in so much pain, we had to take her to the hospital. And Ruth had her at the hospital and stayed with her a day and a half just to, so they could get the pain under control for her because the pain was so great. But when the doctors say, it doesn't look good, she probably won't survive the surgery when the doctors say that, I see the number. And then I say, God, you're in this equation. Yeah. See, some of you are from a background that you're afraid to believe again. You're afraid to trust God because somebody else's story, somebody else's history, somebody else's experience didn't go the way that, that the doctrine said. But you know what? Faith, you have to live out. You just can't play faith. It's not just theory. You have to walk it out. And when I see that young girl, when I sat in my chair looking at that young girl, I heard the word of God say, you shall live and not die. With long life will I satisfy you. That's what I heard. I heard God in the equation. You say, well, well pastor, pastor, what if? What if? See, that's the mind. That's the mind. And some of you, you feel um, 
disingenuous. You feel not being authentic when your mind says this and you want to believe something against your mind. But welcome to faith. If you're going to live by reason and logic, it'll never work. You have to live according to the word of God and what the word of God says. I'm living proof. I have bolt holes in my head from being paralyzed from my neck down in the hospital from falling over 100 feet off a tiger mountain. I lived it being paralyzed and calling that which be not as though it is already was. And I'm standing here today as living proof of it. So maybe this is a part of your journey, your faith journey, to not play church, but to be the church. Because, you know, this isn't some new rodeo. This isn't a new bull that we're facing. Because a new one of our girls had a tumor the size of a baseball in her head, and the doctor said she probably won't survive it. It's inoperable. But guess what? She's 14. The tumor's gone. She survived the surgery, and she's doing amazing. Yeah. It's easy to quit when it looks impossible. But I'm here to tell you, don't quit. Don't quit. Mike Tyson, he said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. Right? Right? Everybody, everybody had a plan pre-COVID. Oh, we're going to serve God. We will trust God. You know what? All of those worship songs that we sang before COVID were probably a bunch of lies for some people. Right? Nothing's, in, nothing's impossible. We will serve you. I will give you my life. I will give you my heart. COVID, shut up. We're like, well... We have to be good citizens because we got punched in the mouth. Come on. You get a good plan. Oh, oh, I've got my, my marriage book, my, my dream dress. I'm going to get married. Life's going to be so wonderful. Married one or two kids later, 3 a.m. in the morning, baby's crying, husband's tired, he don't want to get up, you have to nurse, welcome to life, dirty diapers, nobody changed the diaper genie, and they renamed it wrong because it ain't no genie. <laughs> that thing stinks. False advertisement right there. Don't let them kid you. Don't quit. I've been at this church 30 years. Took over almost 20 years ago. When I did, my mom, she gave me this. She gave me a picture. She didn't give me $1,000. That would have been nice, right? Hey, you're going to be a pastor. Here's $1,000. Didn't get $1,000. I got a, a frame. This frame has been worth more than $1,000 to me. You know where it hangs? In my office, next to my sink in my restroom. Why? See, I'm not here at this church for 30 years because I'm more educated or I'm smarter or I'm more talented. I'm here because I didn't quit. I just didn't quit. We're married because we didn't quit. You think that there's some magic sauce, some little fairy dust that somebody's going to sprinkle over your life and everything? No, no. You're still going to be in the game and you're going to have grandkids around your Christmas tree celebrating because you didn't quit. It says, don't quit. <laughs> when things go wrong, as sometimes they will. When the road you're trudging seems uphill. When the funds are low and the debts are high. 
2008, anyone? <laughs> anyone remember 2008? Hallelujah. And you want to smile, but you have to sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't quit. Success is failure turned inside out. The silver lining of the clouds of doubt. And you can never tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems far. But stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things go wrong, you mustn't quit. Some of you, you're tired. You can't handle one more argument. You can't handle one more treatment. You can't handle one more negative report. You can't handle one more issue with your child, your son, your daughter. We've been around this so many times. Just one more, I can't, I can't handle. I'm telling you, don't quit. It's easy to quit. A lot of people do it. It's easy to tap out. A lot of people do it. But there's no reward in quitting. Here's the ultimate win. Jesus said, what good is it if you gain the whole world and still go to hell. And some of you, if you don't change today, you're gonna go to hell without Jesus. If I don't give you an opportunity to become born again, I've not done my part. But what we do is we give people an opportunity to get born again or renew their salvation because they've, they've drifted away. They've, they've been on the wrong road and it's time to come back. Here's the thing. Don't go to hell with the wrong information. Some of you, you might think you're okay because you were baptized or christened as a child. You might think you're okay because you've attended church. You, th you think you're okay because, well, you, you know the truth about Jesus. You know, he did live and he did die on a cross and he did resurrect. Well, knowing the truth doesn't save you. It's surrendering to the truth that saves you. It's this. Here's salvation. Confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus is your Lord and you will be saved. It's that easy. But I'm telling you, it will cost you everything. Doesn't mean that you got it all figured out, but I'm telling you what, if you surrender to Jesus, he's got you. You say, but yeah, I got these things in my life. I, I, I got this other, don't worry. He, he wants you just the way you are. Let him do the cleaning. Let him do the work. I'm not going to bow heads. I'm not going to close eyes. We don't do that here anymore. Because this is the proudest and best day of your life. Jesus said this, if you acknowledge me before others, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before others, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. So this is your opportunity. What I'm going to do, go ahead and worship team, come. I'm going to ask nobody else move, nobody else leave, nobody else be a distraction. Right now, this is the most important part of the service. They're just going to get in place. But here it is. If you want to receive Christ, I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. And if that's you, you lift your hand. If you lift your hand, we're going to celebrate you. No eyes bowed, heads bowed, no eyes closed. We are going to celebrate you on the best decision of your life because you're acknowledging Jesus before everybody else here. That's it. You just raise your hand. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pray a prayer. I'll say the words. You say them after me. We're going to pray with those that are watching live on the Internet. Even if nobody raises their hands in here, we're still praying for those that are watching live because people are getting born again online every week. But this is your opportunity. It'll be a one, two, three. Raise it up. And we're going to celebrate, and then we're going to pray. All right? Here it is. 
You want to come back to Jesus or come to Jesus for the very first time? Here it is. Raise it up. One, two, three. Lift your hand up. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see that. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. Hallelujah. All right, everybody, pray with me. Heavenly Father, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin. I accept your son, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Live in me as I live for you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Come on.